meeting of the Tenant Landlord Commission. My name is David Tim. I am the chair of said commission. And uh, we are having a, a, a meeting where the Housing Commission is present, although I understand that they are not technically meeting themselves here today. Um, so we're going to get started with roll call uh, for those present and then move to uh, approve the minutes from last month. So I'll just start here, Matt Royer. Here. And Kristen Clegg. Here. Garrett Mukherjee. Here. Uh, Sarah Lanford. Here. Welcome, new tenant representative. Sarah Lanford, thank you for coming. Uh, Emily Camardo. Here. Uh, and I, David Tim, am present. I believe that gives us a quorum. So uh, let's call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll start first with approval of. We have no minutes. I I I will unilaterally approve the non-existent <laughs> minutes in that case. Oh, and, and perfect. Uh, Ryan Whitaker, present. Present. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, it wasn't close at all with the quorum, so that's great. Uh, we'll go straight into. Oh, I see. Thank you. We've got a couple people joining us. The uh, video who from the commission. Anyone? Rolda, were you trying to? No, uh, I was just. Oh. Text. Okay. Um, so with that, we have a, a very full agenda. It's a big meeting for us, obviously, uh, and it's important to have the housing commission here as we've been working on these uh, aging aging property report, and uh, the county's been hard at work um, on long-term calf strategies. Uh, so we're excited to hear that presentation from Amnesia. Uh, but first, we're going to go to public comments. And I think we have a few people signed up. So I understand uh, someone named Frank Duncan has signed yeah. up. OK. Hey, Frank. Hey, so good to, good to meet you. Uh, how it works here is we have three minutes for public comments. Um, and uh, you know, we'll put up a, a timer on the screen, I think. Okay, uh, you ready for me now? Miss. Okay. Yep, we're ready for you. All right, I'm Frank Duncan, and I live in a shelter apartment in Arlington. And I sent this out for the simple fact here that we have a problem in my apartment complex. And so the other resident is scared to come out to talk. So they sent me because the simple fact is I have been there since it opened. Now, I have the papers here that number one we got a problem with number one we got a problem with a water bill. The young lady right here, she got a water bill for five thousand dollars, and I got proof right here. It's a five thousand dollar water bill. Then they also got the resident paying late fee for a water bill that's not included with the rent. And so they constantly each month get a paper on their door threaten them to tell them they're going to put them out in 30 days. And most of them in there is uh, like senior citizen and they worry sick that they're going to get put out. Now we've been going back and forth over this water bill thing. Now if we're in a public complex, like I said, I have proof to show you that we got a bill for $5,000 for a water bill for one month. Now and also when you go to the go to the rent office, the manager is so disrespectful that she do not have time to listen to what we have to say. So they don't go in there, so they come to get me to go in there to talk. And also, as far as the water bill and the, and the late fee for the water bill, it, they constantly give you a bill each month for different things that it's their fault and not the uh, resident fault, but they have changed manager over for the last, that, since the corona, it'd be like four managers. And they've been, they've been trying, now we, we got a new manager called Harbor Group. And I'm gonna, uh, I don't have number one copy of this, I don't need this, but the new manager in, we have a meeting Friday at our resident. And they want the meeting, now they came up with it, what the problem is. And the problem is the same thing I'm talking about. And if there wasn't no problem, they wouldn't want to have a meeting with this. So I'm just going to just 
pass this on, y'all can look at it. I don't, I don't need it. But uh, it was just, the thing is, um, we done went back and forth to, to, to different people to, for someone to come and look at the problem going on in our building. I had a young lady to go in there that don't even live there. Uh, she went to the head manager. The head manager told her to go to the office and induce herself and let, let them know what she do. She went in there and the, the manager that was in there and second. disrespect her. And the young lady I was talking about is, is sitting right here. And the only reason why I had to do this to her because it was, like it, it was so important that I got here to speak of this. So I do appreciate y'all listening. Yeah. And I thank you. And I wish somebody could go and look into it for us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Uh, I just want to recognize for the record that uh, Elder Basorto is, is present. Um, let's uh, open it up to commissioners uh, for any uh, thoughts or questions. Yeah. Mr. Duncan. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, the, the, the water bill is set, sent from your landlord or is that from directly from the county? So the landlord, well, this is the problem. We're trying to figure out, do we have our own meter? Ain't nobody ever show it to us. So what they do, they just- Wait, wait hold on, what's on the bill? Yeah. Uh, from the landlord. The, the bill, it bills from the landlord? Yes. Okay, did they give you the, because the county bills for water. So if the, the county has to give them a bill, so you should get proof of right. what but they see, billed the landlord. My thing is, is um, a family that was there and they went home Back to their country for a whole month. There was nobody in their apartment, and they got a, a water bill for one hundred ten dollars. But so that's. But I understand that there might be a problem with the billing. There might be a leak. There might be a number of different issues. See, that's what. That's what we. we I know, but wait, sir, sir, I yeah, just give, give me a second. So what I what I would suggest you do is ask for the county water bill that they that the that the building received in order to pass that bill along to whoever's getting a high bill. They should be able to prove to you that they got a bill. Um, of X amount, and that's why you're getting what you're getting. And th and then if there's a leak, there should be something about you know that your landlord might have to deal with the leak because it's obviously not your building. So if there's a leak, you know the landlord should be able to investigate the leak. And frankly, they should be able to get. Usually, you can get bill relief from the county uh, if there is a leak, you know, on a one-time basis or whatever. It's a case-by-case -case thing. But the first thing you need to do is you need to find the bill that goes behind what the landlord passed along to you. Thanks, Ryan. Any other commissioner comments, questions? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Matt. Oh, uh, what was the uh, the time frame where that five thousand dollars was incurred? Well, it was a month. He said it was a month. Yeah. I mean, that is an astronomically large water bill for a month. And that's well, for one apartment. Yes. Yes. She, and the young lady is sitting right here. In that it's her bill for one day. And that yes. was for one month. Right. Okay, uh, I didn't bring this up, but uh, we were there for a whole whole week with no hot water, right? So we went through all this to try to get them to give us a hot water, and they couldn't get it. So they finally got us, finally got the hot water, and then my thing was, and they, they apologized to us about no hot water or nothing. Yeah, I understand. Hey, uh, yes, Julio, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say that, you know, I'm remembering, thank you for uh, your comments and for your favor to come here. I'm remembering that this building has had issues since 2016. They were actually prior to what happened at Serrano. And the right. same thing, yes, there was about 16 residents and the same things were occurring there that are occurring at Serrano apartments. You know, we got the leaks, we got the bills, security, the treatment at the office no hot water, we have security issues outside of the building, around the building. I would just like to see, you know, you know, I was one of the residents from Serrano Apartments. I would like to see some kind of action taken so that we don't keep repeating the same thing. We can always call somebody to say, hey, this is an issue that's happening at this building, but why is that AHC Inc? Why, why are they not reaching out to their buildings and checking what's going on? Obviously, nothing has changed at the, at the shelter. We're in 2023 now. Correct. Thank you for your comments. Thank sir. you. So for the uh, woman who has the $5,000 bill, 
how long have you lived there and do you have a history of previous months where you can demonstrate that it was typically $80 or $70? How? Okay, uh, she got a, uh, it tell you what her bill was from month to month. Mm. And yes, uh, she do have, have that. And it's, the thing is, the water bill is not supposed to be with the rent. They said it ain't with the rent. You got a different water bill, a different rent. But then they said no, both of them together. So it was, go ahead now. Oh, no, go ahead. I, I just, so it's so confusing because the simple fact is one time the shelter didn't never had to pay water. And then all of a sudden it just popped up. Half of them were paying it, half of them wasn't. And half of them uh, that were paying it was the people that weren't on house grant or, or Section 8. They weren't paying water. But then all of a sudden they put it all back. They had everybody paying it. But when they put it that everybody paid, the people that wasn't paying it, they were trying to get them to pay back the money that they weren't supposed to be paying. Right. What I was going to say, and, and obviously we haven't read your lease, but just for clarification to anybody in the room, that depending on how the lease is written, your utility can become rent. Right. Just depending on how the lease is written. And that is why it non, if your lease is written this way, the fact that you're getting notices about late rent when it's really utilities is just because of the way the lease is written. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because the simple fact is most of them don't have a lease. The, the, uh, most of them lease, the, the last time they had a lease, it was before the corona. They have not uh, got them back in the office to let them sign a new lease. They're working on that manual service. Well, they're under their old lease going month to month, right? Yeah. That would be the yeah. only right. Way. I understand that part, yeah. but they haven't but, signed a new lease. Or but they, but what they do, they send a letter out to the resident and threaten them and tell them if you don't come down here to sign a new lease, we're going to put you out. But you go down there, they said, no, we're not ready for you. It ain't mm -hmm. time for you to come and do it. Yeah. Uh, Chair, Chair McBeth of the Housing Commission. Um, do we, so I think Shelton is, is it mixed caps and market rate? Is that correct? It's all caps? Okay. Has the, has county staff been involved in, or is this the first time they're hearing about the issue? Okay. Um, I think it would probably be helpful if county staff is able to set up a meeting with uh, the management at the Shelton um, and whatever individuals are impacted by this. Um, to try and sort of mediate, resolve the issue, because, I mean, it definitely sounds like there's a problem, um, and I think the county should be able to, to step in and at least help get to the bottom of that. Um, okay, a um, while back, I went to... Mr. Duncan, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to keep a relatively right, tight on. schedule. Right, we got a lot of things. No, I, I understand. Um, I really appreciate you coming in and uh, speaking with us. We're going to immediately start looking into this uh, with county staff and uh, we'll contact you with some some resources following the meeting. Uh, Rolda probably will be the one to send that to you. And uh, if you have any other further concerns, you can definitely direct it to back to Rolda um, you know, in response to those resources. And otherwise, uh, you know, we, we encourage you to contact the county if there's any code enforcement issues that you encounter. It's difficult to start some of these processes without contacting the code enforcement first. But we're going to start that process on your behalf. Yes. I just want to just say, you know, there is a, a clear power dynamic here, and folks that are living in CAF units shouldn't have to face the full weight and strength of the county government to fix their water bill. I think that they shouldn't have to come to the Housing Commission and Tenant Landlord Commission to raise the issue. I think we as commissioners need to ask AHC in the county what programs are in place so that residents don't have to come to a meeting like this to try to address their concerns. Yep, Ryan. So uh, actually, I agree with that. And what we, we, when we talked about Serrano before, and I'm just asking maybe as a strategic priority for what we're doing here, that we continue to ask the county board to hold entities for whom they are giving subsidized housing dollars uh, accountable 
for the conditions at the various properties that these facilities run. And I know they hire property management groups like Harbor Management and others. But you know, as a as a as a client, essentially, they have the right to say to Harbor Management, "You're not doing what we need you to do." And the county, as the funding source for that, you know, for those entities, has the right to say, "You guys need to uh, ex exercise a lot more clear, uh, diligent oversight." So I think we should. I think that's something we should raise as a commission. To be honest with you, it probably fits very well with. I don't know what, exactly what your charter is, but I would imagine it fits well with the Housing Commission charter too. And the top of right. <laughs> okay, so okay. I, I have the other meeting at the other, uh, but my question to you, who, who can I get a call for from? Uh, uh, Rolla will, will send you an email uh, okay. after the meeting is no finished, problem. and so you'll have her contact information and, and uh, we can go from there. We really appreciate your testimony, Mr. Duncan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to move to yes. our next public comment here. Uh, it's Sharon Dunham. And she's provided some written remarks, but uh, we'll also speak on that. Right now. And Hector, in, in light of Ms. Dunham's uh, uh, disability, I think a reasonable accommodation with regard to the timers appropriate. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
there was garbage in rodents that, that has played this conference for two years. Because of my speech impairment, I, I asked my mother, who's been living with me for about two years because of my, my additional disability, to, to come up and, and give the rest of my, my speech. Uh, and also, uh, I'm accompanied by Heather. She's also a resident of Clinton Court. She will have her own speech time. Right now, I have my mother Jane and I come out. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm reading Shimon's testimony, so it's in the first person. Um, today, my testimony is concentrated on the garbage and rodent problem that has existed for two years at Clarendon Court included our images which demonstrate the issue and the responsibility of blame is twofold, tenants <coughs> and management. One, garbage is consistently placed. Excuse me, do you have the, the pictures that I left with you? Yes, yeah, that's what we have Well, more than just, I left, it's, there's different images, so those, it's more than one picture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, two, garbage is visible to guests visiting residents in the C building. Three, the garbage attracts rats which arrive after dark for feeding. There is a family of, at minimum, six rats. The rats are a potential safety and health hazard. The garbage area is located in an accessible parking area for wheelchair users. The only curb cut to access my wheelchair lift van is located in the accessible parking area, which is in the same area as the garbage. At night, when using the curb cut, I am at risk of encountering the rats who scurry around the sidewalk of the area. My apartment is located outside of the garbage area. Heather McDaniel's apartment also abuts the garbage area. She is blind and also at risk of running alongside, of rats running alongside the back of her unit. 10, in addition to the garbage area, the rats also run throughout the complex and parking lot. They invaded my van and patio, patio area of my unit. And you'll see where there's feces on the top of the engine in, in her van, and the van is $80,000, I want you to know. So. Um, 11, another neighbor who has a high school age son who is a wheelchair user also cannot park her car in the accessible parking spaces because of the rats. Receipt, attached for purchases of my financial commitment to try to resolve the issue, approximately $1,692, which she spent. Six new garbage receptacles, four new recycling receptacles, rodent repellent signage, and tape for garbage can repair. Communication, spoke with the office multiple times suggested cameras, suggested going through garbage left on the ground, and setting notices to individuals. And four, inquired responsibility of tenants as provided in the lease. Um, suggestions, one, enlarge garbage area for more receptacles. Currently, only six garbage receptacles for 36 families. Two, add a fence wall in front of the opening to the garbage area. Three, camera to identify violators. Four, send lease violation notices. And five, inform in Arlington County. Conclusion, I would like the Arlington County Tenant Landlords Commission to assist Clarity Court in holding violating tenants responsible and assist tenants to hold Clarity Court responsible for resolving the issues. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming to speak today. Uh, we really appreciate you. your, your thoughtful testimony. Um, I'll open it up to commissioners for Questions and thoughts. Yeah, Chairman Ben. Um, question: is, is this cap or just all the market rate? I don't, I don't know anything about Clarence Court. Yeah. That constitutes. Yeah. Or a question to anyone who knows the answer. Yeah. If it's uh, if they're committed affordable units or if they're all market rate units. Um. So, and the reason I ask is just the levers that the county would have over the, the landlord or the property owner. Um, so if it's, if they're market rate units, and I'm trying to think based on what you it, described. It may be market rate, but it has income limit. Oh, interesting. Okay. Oh, okay. So okay. then that doesn't sound like market rate then. Okay. No, it's not. Okay. Income okay. limit. There, there are right. people there with housing vouchers. As a matter of fact, um, the lady that we identified with the son, um, there are a lot of immigrant families and they were afraid to come in and mm -hmm. voice their complaints. And so um, we have that issue too. Um, so. Yeah, Kristen. 
So uh, this is a statement and a suggestion possibly. The uh, Arlington County has very strict regulations uh, that hold all uh, multifamily housing communities to a standard of the amount of trash uh, pickup versus the amount of recycling pickup. And actually it's, it's very heavily regulated and every community must submit an annual report of how many trash pickups they have each week and how many recycling pickups they have. And they there's a very sophisticated algorithm for the ratios. And then they come out and inspect your property to ensure. So the, uh, the multifamily housing is compliant uh, with their regulations. You know, we can help from a sort of a landlord perspective and obviously we should reach out, but I would highly encourage you to reach out directly to the Arlington County's trash and recycling program. Elizabeth Crowler is her name. She's a she's a great person, a great resource. Let her know that, you know, based on your experience, there's there's something wrong. I mean, either all the everyone in your community is over trashed and over recycled, or maybe your neighbors are putting trash in there. But based on the photos that you've presented, as a landlord myself, I don't think that they're in compliance with the, the expectations of the county. I don't know that for a fact, of course, but that might be a very good place to start um, that has some teeth to it. I mean, it, it they're just sort of something uh, to put out can, there. Can someone give us that name? Yeah, we will. Uh, in fact, roll the right. We'll, we'll make an internal referral and, and we'll copy you, Roll that we can coordinate that right with. OK, great. We'll we'll uh, make an introduction and also, you know, advocate for, for them to take a look, a closer look at this as well uh, internally and, and we'll keep you updated on on the progress. But Ryan, you had a. Yeah, I mean, in addition to what you were going to say, Kristen, I, I'm a landlord too and I sympathize because sometimes trash is something that landlords can't completely control when people dump all the time and, and we try to stay ahead of the problem and the problem keeps getting worse. So it's, it's a very difficult. However, the landlord should be able to take steps to try to minimize dumping or whether it's tenants or people from outside you know, offsite that dump at the property to create the situation you're talking about. The first step, I think we should refer it to the recycling program as Kristen or you suggested. But secondly, to the extent that there's pests, as you mentioned, you know, rats are a public health hazard. You know, I think we should also refer this, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, to uh, the Department of Public Health and have them look into it as well because to the extent that the trash is creating a public health hazard, you know, that's not safe for residents. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I don't like spurious uh, ADA claims, but it, it sounds like they might not even be ADA compliant with where their, their trash receptacles are relative to their uh, parking spaces. So uh, that's an easy, and that's a county code enforcement thing that is, you know, they could be out there tomorrow. Yep, we'll include them in the in the email that we sent. It's interesting that it can cry to gather someone street north Short term, we should do all of that, but this is long term, very much part of this discussion. Yeah, so. Right. Thanks. Well, 
Um, most properties they have uh, maintenance and maintenance to come around in the morning time. Is maintenance not involved with the upkeep of the property, and that usually includes the maintenance. The, we have one maintenance person, and he does the best he, he can. Um, he, uh, he does a month of he, he goes outside with you. Oh, right. well, uh, I thought this was an APA property. Uh, Clarendon Courts, um, well, it's under the county CAF uh, affordable housing. I wanted to know who was the, pro I don't know if you mentioned the property management company. McCormick Bay. to mention this, but I think we uh, already reached out, right, Rola, to the Code enforcement company. Yeah. 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 We already reached out to Code enforcement. 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 Code enforcement need of that handicap spots have those ever been an, have you ever been able to have there ever been an instance where you haven't been able to use those because the trash has been so bad no but i i Frustrating that it's it's still existing, and we're going to do our best to help you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And and Heather McDaniel's, uh, if you'd like to speak as well, please. Thank you very much for. Um, Allowing me to speak. Okay, can y'all hear me? Yes. 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 A quiet voice. Um, yes, my name's Heather McDaniel, also a tenant at uh, Clarendon Court apartment complex. I've lived there for about five years. In that time, I, I've noticed a lot of things uh, with the, the uh, rodents there. The, 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 uh, although I'm unable to see the rats, I can hear them. Uh, when I go outside, I, I, I get afraid of, of putting out the trash and everything although i do it and i i, I see the uh the rat the little um cockroaches and stuff around the apartment and i, I spray it and I, i've asked periodically for them to come and, and do the, the spraying in my apartment and they're like well we'll put you on the list and thing but my um thing is is the safety issues of that clarendon court I'm a woman who's blind live, living alone single and um, when I go in the laundry facility, 
I, I see a lot of uh, litter and um, the, the laundry machines, you know, the washer dryers are dirty. And um, there, there are homeless people that are sleeping in the laundry facility. They, 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 they don't keep keys. They don't give us keys to the laundry facility. And people from the shelter or off the streets can go in there and, and they sleep there. They, they make it their, um, their rooms and they sleep there. And um, I reported it to the leasing office and they, they, they're like, oh, I'm sorry. And they do nothing. And I, I called the police and, and they're like, well, call the non-emergency number. I called the non-emergency number. And they're like, well, unless they're in your house or they put their hands on you, this conversation is over and they hung up on me. I, I called them several times last winter because the homeless people in there. I, I screamed the guy out of there. And um, what did he do? He complimented me. And I threw him out of there, the laundry room. And um, I'm honestly scared. Uh, um, a, a woman living alone, um, living there blind. Um, I, I've had a lot of people there, Clarendon Court, bother me, harass me. Um, I really think it's an unsafe neighborhood for a blind woman living there alone. I, I don't mean to use this negative grandiosity on you all, but um, it scares me sometimes. Uh, um, the, these, these men have, uh, really try to take advantage of me, and um, I, I've, I've really had it. I've reported to the leasing office. And I told them um, if they ever try to bother me again, they will not have the strength to see a physical therapist. But thank you very much for listening to me. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you. Any commissioners with thoughts? I had a question. Uh, yeah. Is your laundry room locked? No, they, I, I've it's asked them. Um, leasing office there in court. They said they will give us the keys. They will have keys to shoot. And um, they did not. This was our, our prior um, management, and they did not. It, okay. And is the laundry room in a locked building? No. no. no so it's, it's, it's so the access there's no barrier. The access is from right. zero we barrier. Have, Got it. We have a shelter. Uh, frankly, sounds like not too difficult of a fix, um, and I think we, in our well, within our rights, to reach out to the to the uh, the management company and, and suggest that they do this. Um, so, unless there's any other comments. Um, uh, no, I, was just, I mean, that's a liability for the, the landlord for them as well. well of course. Anything, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard to imagine much more uh, closely aligned interests in preventing uh, this uh, obviously unsafe situation. So do we know who owns the property? Like, is it one of the oh that's, that's the management. That's the management company. Yeah, yeah. that's the, 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 owner. the owner. The owner and the owner. Oh, okay. uh, they're yeah. both. So, okay. Okay. They may, but that's certainly a safety issue, which again is what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's also disconcerting to hear that uh, potentially that um, that Ms. McDaniel called the county. Uh, yeah. Sound is like sounded like with regards right. to folks getting at least maybe temporary shelter or services, and if you know that was not received well, a little a little curious about what happened there because we have a pretty robust network. Right. Mm -hmm. We take this very seriously with the yeah. early, you know, all this, right? You can really count everything. So it sounds like maybe there's multiple failures mm -hmm. here. Yeah, I agree. So, I got so, a message from the housing yeah. 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 Yeah.
So there's no lease in Pennsylvania. So I think they're based out of Chicago or someplace. Illinois. Midwest. Yeah. Midwest, yeah. yeah. Minnesota. 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 Okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Wow. That is far away. So if it's a tax credit <laughs> property, it's not necessarily <laughs> <a> <laughs> county. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean AHIP money was used. We right? have. So I think AHIP money was used. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. It does. So it's directly applicable to what we're going to talk about. Yeah. So what we're well, seeing. We're going to have loan in 2016. And then segue then. I don't, I think that was the end of the public comment, right? Us, so uh, we'll go right into it, I believe, and that you're the one presenting. Is that is that right? Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm here. I'm I'm ready to present. So here, let right. me go on camera. All right. It looks like we have the slides up and everything. So. Um, so again, I'm Ann Venezia. I'm the housing director for Arlington. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. Um, this is probably the biggest commission audience I've ever spoken to. It's really a pleasure to have both commissions together in one room. So, um, so the purpose of our presentation tonight is to provide an update on the county's recommendations on the long-term strategies for improved oversight and tenant support at aging cap properties. So you may recall that this report and the um, recommendations were released in April 2022, so about a year ago, and they they were a result of extensive discussions with staff and the community, many of you, on ways to inform a more proactive and coordinated long-term approach to the county's oversight and resident services. So next slide. So county staff began to develop these recommendations during its response to issues at the Serrano in 2021. And although the scope and strategies quickly became larger, Many of the opportunities and long-term strategies focus on clarifying roles and responsibilities while also improving communication and coordination. So specifically, the recommendations identified 17 strategies, which span five work areas. And I'll be going through these different work areas in just a moment. And these strategies aim to inform a more proactive long-term approach, as I said a moment ago, to resident services and county oversight while still enabling owners and property managers to lead these efforts. Again, ultimately, given the role of the county, we really do rely on owners to be proactive and to manage their properties well. So a year later, we are excited to report on progress in many of these areas and are here to present highlights from this one year report. Next slide. So just to go through the structure of the report, I think that Rolda and Alex shared this with the commissioners earlier today. It really is comprised of two sections. So the first few pages touch on highlights from the past year. And then the second part of the report is an appendix, which really provides detailed updates on each strategy. So tonight I'm gonna really focus on the highlights, but I do encourage you to take a look at the more detailed section as well. So next slide. So the first area of opportunity that was identified in that 2022 report is oversight and asset management. So assuming um, not everyone in the room has recently read it, I'm going to just remind everyone what that strategy is or that area of opportunity. Um, and what it states is the county's oversight of affordable housing properties should be strengthened to ensure property owners and managers are providing safe and high quality living environments for residents and are meeting residents' expectations for services and unit conditions. So to support this goal, the county has made strides in several areas these last 12 months. So first, CPHD housing um, has increased cap inspections, so inspections at committed affordable properties, from approximately 5 to 10% of the portfolio annually to 20% of the portfolio annually and is in the process of hiring an additional staff person to focus on compliance, communication, and conflict resolution. So as you can see from the chart, we have significantly increased our inspections just over the last year. Next slide. We strengthened our oversight and asset management in additional ways as well. So DHS has procured a vendor to increase their inspections capacity for the more than 1,800 units that have a rental subsidy. And this contract will go into effect in 2024. 
So just as CPHD housing has increased our inspections capacity, DHS is right behind us and they're gonna be doing the same thing next year. Additionally, the county now has a vendor to assist with environmental testing, which includes mold testing. So these services can be used as needed. So specifically, um, again, as some of you may recall, when we did do full inspections in Serrano, we did see some moisture issues in some of the units that um, we wanted to do some follow-up environmental testing. So now we have a vendor um, on call. So if we do see um, moisture or uh, suspected mold in any of our units that's concerning, we do have an opportunity to follow up and do testing if we need to do that. Next slide. So the second area of opportunity that was identified in the 2022 report is capital investment. And so this, this area of opportunity aims to explore additional resources and strategic planning to ensure the long-term sustainability of the county's aging housing stock. So in this area, we made progress on several fronts this past year. First, we added language to our AF agreements to strengthen requirements for inspections and compliance, including reporting on progress if a certain number of issues or a certain number of units, excuse me, don't pass inspection um, the first go around. Additionally, language was added to strengthen eviction prevention measures and support resident councils at properties. So again, this language that I'm referring to in our AHIP agreements, this is going into effect for projects that are going to closing from this point forward. And lastly, staff explored additional enforcement opportunities via our site plan conditions. So we worked with our county attorney's office, our planning staff, our zoning staff, a variety of folks from around the county, really just to see if there's another enforcement mechanism that we could explore beyond our AHIP agreements. So while we don't recommend pursuing this approach, it did prompt um, further conversations internally around enforcement mechanisms and what's within the county's authority to be able to um, enforce. So next slide. The third area of opportunity is coordination. And specifically, um, this area says that the county should develop a more systematic and coordinated process to inform interagency response to oversight trends and resident concerns. So for this area of opportunity, progress made the last 12 months includes the following. First, the county manager's office has convened an interdepartmental team to address CAF properties and their needs. This team includes representation from five different county departments and 10 different program areas and has met quarterly since June 2022. This coordination has helped develop and grow relationships among our agencies and has already resulted in improved coordination. And so a couple examples of this. Um, we have certain agencies that have worked on improving um, internal code enforcement referral process um, so that we can better link Again, any concerns that might be code enforcement related to the relevant staff more quickly, resulting in greater resolution. Also, the county's environmental health team has received and addressed several service request referrals for both CPHD and DHS at our CAF properties. And again, the, the positive thing of that is it helps resolve these issues more quickly. Um, and that's really the goal with all of these strategies. In addition, DHS housing, has created a new landlord engagement position to help improve communications and relationships with landlords, especially for those properties using DHS programs and subsidies. And so that position is expected to be filled in fiscal year 24. And lastly, the county manager's office and county board office are implementing a new customer relationship management platform. And this allows the county to track constituent inquiries and interactions as well as support advisory commission recruitment and coordination process. So really what it is, it's a plat this platform is a first step in strengthening interdepartmental coordination and communication. The goal is that eventually, um, as different agencies within the county are, um, are tracking the, the inquiries that we receive from residents, that we might be able to um, be better positioned to see trends. You know, are there certain properties where we're seeing more complaints or more concerns? Um, or, you know, again, certain owners where we're seeing more complaints, more concerns, you know, so that we can um, do a better job with our oversight and following up with those properties and owners accordingly. Next slide. The fourth area of opportunity is problem solving. And this addresses staff's needs for additional tools and resources to help solve resident concerns. And there are several strategies within this area of opportunity that the county has progressed this last year. 
First, the county's tenant landlord commission, well, some of you in the room, uh, with support from county staff, is researching potential models for alternative dispute resolution to provide an additional resource to address tenant and landlord conflicts. And my understanding is that recommendations are expected in 2023, and you all can feel free to chime in if you have a little more on the timing there. Um, additionally, a discussion group that um, it includes commissioners, county staff, and advocates has been assessing the potential creation of resident councils at CAF properties, as well as other strategies to strengthen tenant engagement. Further, all housing staff from CPHD and DHS have participated in customer service and racial equity training. Training will continue in these areas as well as in technical areas related to housing. And lastly, a DHS housing locator is actively tracking vacancies in the community to support homeless service providers and clients experiencing homelessness. Efforts are underway to recruit private landlords and property owners who rent at affordable rents to include them in this housing inventory for DHS programs. So this includes further education of the various forms of supportive services and rental subsidy programs that are available in the community. So again, trying to connect um, the clients who need those services and, and help educate the landlords and owners who can help you know, connect everybody together. And in addition, DHS was recently granted um, an added housing locator to work with low-income households that are impacted by evictions or are in need of relocation supports. So again, really trying to increase these available services. Next slide. So the fifth and final area of opportunity is communication and outreach. Specifically, the 2022 report states that county agencies should coordinate and streamline information on available resources and appropriate contacts so it's clear to staff, property owners, and residents what county resources are available. If a concern is, you know, if a resident has a concern and they're not getting it resolved by their or with their property owner, who do they call? How do they get in touch and get connected with um, county resources? Or if they're struggling to pay their rent, Again, how can they best connect to DHS and the relevant staff who can see um, what, what programs they may be eligible for? So basically, this whole bucket of strategies is really trying to um, improve our outreach and also the resources that we can provide to residents to ensure they know what resources are available to them. So progress made this past year includes the following. First, the county is using one-time funding to reach approximately 500 households at CAF properties through surveys and focus groups to learn about the resident experience and what additional resident supports may be helpful. Community-based organization Bugatta is conducting this outreach with a report expected in summer 2023. Additionally, CPHD is coordinating bilingual, user-friendly outreach materials that describe county services available to residents. And we're doing this by soliciting materials from around the county. So that inter interdepartmental group that I mentioned a couple slides earlier um, that has been meeting, we, we talked to all of them and said, if you could share a one pager um, to residents and owners that talk about the services that you provide, what would be on it? And so what we're doing is we're putting together this bundle of resources that will be available electronically and also in paper form. And we're looking to distribute these materials to all CAF properties and all residents living in CAF properties this summer. Further, several countywide events these past 12 months, including the Live in Arlington Information Fairs in October and in April, incorporated resident education on tenant rights and responsibilities, as well as available county resources. So to continue this outreach, we're organizing a tenant summit for June 6th, and Rolda is leading that effort, and we're really excited for it. Lastly, the Arlington County Public Health Division mailed all CAF properties an outreach letter encouraging property management to contact environmental health technicians to receive a free consultation on pest control. So again, really trying to advertise their services. They're available to go to CAF properties and do a survey, see where there might be points of entry. Um, you know, one of the um, speakers tonight, one of the residents that came and spoke and talked about trash you know, are there ways to better maintain trash and, and increase pickups and things like that? Um, you know, trimming uh, landscaping, all sorts of different strategies and um, public health is available to advise on that. 
So as I shared earlier, in addition to these highlights, more details on the status of specific strategies can be found in the appendix of the report. And the appendix is pretty lengthy. Again, there are 17 strategies, so I'm not going to go through the whole appendix. I will spare you that. Um, but I do encourage you to take a look at it um, following this meeting. So last slide. So while a lot of progress has been made, the county continues its efforts to improve oversight and tenant supports, and will continue to report on this progress going forward as part of its annual affordable housing master plan report beginning in 2024. So again, shared a lot of different or a lot of progress in different areas tonight. Again, there's a lot more in the appendix, but the work is ongoing. Um, as some of you may recall, when this report came together last year, this really was framed as a multi-year effort. And so um, we really look forward to hearing um, any additional ideas that folks have, any questions that you have for me, and I'm happy to turn it back over to the commission. Thank you, Anne. It's always a pleasure to have you at, at the TLC, and uh, we really appreciate the important and, and difficult work that you're doing. I am gonna open it up to commissioners who have questions or comments. Yeah, Chair McBeth. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ann. Really appreciate all of the hard work that you and your team put into not only the original document, but also uh, the implementation over the last year and then this update and report. Um, I have a lot of questions. I'll just start with the first and let other people have questions. Um, so for the highlights, the third bullet down under oversight and asset management, um, you talked about the county has procured a vendor that specializes in environmental testing, including mold testing and remediation. Um, so I was hoping for some more um, context about that. I know one of the recommendations in the joint uh, TLC and Housing Commission report was to provide free mold testing for uh, Arlington County residents. Um, is that what this is for? Is this just an internal tool for the county to use when they need mold testing uh, for units? Can you? talk about who that's sort of meant to serve and how that works. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as of now, um, it really is intended to be an internal tool uh, for our compliance staff. So as they're out doing inspections, if they see signs of excess moisture, um, anything that seems concerning where, you know, potentially it could be a sign of an environmental hazard, uh, whether it be mold or, or some other concern, um, it's a tool that we have available to us. Um, our, the way this, the laws work in the state, you do have to be licensed um, in order to be able to um, ascertain whether a substance is in fact mold, um, for instance, or asbestos or, or any other potential environmental hazard. So as a result, we really do need to rely on our licensed experts to be able to um, provide that information if our compliance staff has a concern. So right now it really is intended to be an internal tool. And can we get on your uh, your calendar for a meeting in the summer after you complete the uh, the CAF uh, you know, resource you know, groups and uh, you know, have the ability to hear what those residents had to say? Yeah, I was going to say we really were anxious to return to all of you to talk about the progress we've made the, these last 12 months and we had committed to doing that. There's going to be so much information that we're getting in the next like three to four to five months that I think we'll have to come back. Um, yeah. And so block your summer calendars. Um, no <laughs> one's taking vacation um, because we're going to be ha we'll have a lot of information on the resident experience surveys and focus groups. Um, we'll have results from the spring inspections that we're doing right now. Um, I know the chart that we had on the earlier slide was really tiny. It's bigger in the in the actual report, but we're anticipating doing over 2,000 inspections this year. Um, and so we're going to have the results from those inspections. So we're going to have a lot of really good information to share over the next few months. Um, so we'd be happy to come back and, and talk through some of that. Yep. Let's, so uh, this is a teaser. Let's coordinate. <laughs> yeah, on that one. Eric. Yeah, so um, one of the questions I have, Ian, and maybe this is maybe this is the inspections, maybe it's good enforcement, but um, you know, looking at this report, thinking about the whole runway of these issues, um, and then also thinking about the folks that came and spoke, uh, spoke tonight, I think it would be fair to say that one of the common themes that we've heard, and it makes sense, is speed and time and 
that these issues, it's great to have holistic plans and it's great to have processes. But we had somebody who's saying, can you please get rid of the trash right now? We had another person say, you know, I can't uh, park in the accessible parking spot because rats are going to infest my car and they're going to ruin the engine. So um, I think my question is sort of like, um, to what degree are we measuring like the effectiveness of the, the speediness of resolutions when it comes to issues like that if it's if it's from these inspections because the processes are important but like we also need quick results in some of these instances like we don't necessarily need a long runway to get somebody to clean up trash either the property it just needs to happen like immediately yep. so you sort of do you understand what i'm asking like how much I do that the county's effort here that the, the equity of speed yeah, no, and um, I I think our, you know, our preference always is for residents to try to work with their landlords and with the owners first. If that is not working, if, you know, the resident says, I have tried to reach out and the response either it wasn't responsive, it didn't address my concern, or the landlord or owner didn't answer me at all, or any concerns at all with how they, you know, those concerns were addressed. Um, our goal is to make very easily accessible to residents ways to get in touch with us. Um, the fastest way to resolution often is to work with landlords and the owners directly um, because they're best equipped to actually address the issue on site immediately as it's happening. Again, if that is not working, we want residents to have at their fingertips the phone numbers that they can call at the county to get in touch with the appropriate agencies so that we can follow up and we can try to get resolution as quickly as possible. So for instance, some of the issues that we heard about tonight, um, I checked with staff while we were hearing about them and, and these, this is the first time we've heard of some of these issues. Um, I can't speak for the owners. Um, so, you know, Rolda, we will, you know, be following up and working with Rolda to get the information so we can follow up. Um, but, you know, certainly we would hope that residents have avenues to get their concerns resolved without having to come to a commission, without having to come to a public meeting in order to get um, attention for those issues. Um, so our goal would be to create easy and comfortable ways um, for residents to seek resolution without having to come to public meetings in order to have that happen. So um, does that answer your question, Eric? No, it, I, I mean, it does. I mean, I think it ultimately comes back to, and I steal some of Saul's points, and, you know, uh, he made earlier Saul's here. You know, it does come back to the quality of the resident services with the providers and obviously the relation, you know, the management company, you know, adequately addressing these issues when they're actually brought up. If it's coming to the county, the failure may have already occurred, right? And now we're going right. to yeah, absolutely. Process. And I think that most of us would likely agree that we don't want the default is that the county government does everything. You know, we right. have providers that we've selected here, and so we do need them to to do the work. It just, I'm sorry, I'm being a little long-winded here. It sort of strikes me, and this is stealing some of Kellen's ideas here, it sort of strikes me that as a long-term project, this is just another example of how residents need more rights to to really counteract uh, uh, property owners that aren't fulfilling their obligations and that is like a complaint process there's a legal recourse other than just going to district court and filing something that's a longer term legislative project but certainly um, there may be an impetus for these commissions to think about you know advocating long term to try to give residents more tools so they can proactively kind of have more leverage anyway that's it sorry i was a little long winded there i don't know right Actually, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said, Eric. Um, and thanks for your report. I, when, you know, one of the big things, it seems to me that the county has all the levers that it needs to pull in order to do these various things, whether it's, you know, I mean, everything from at the extreme end, police, if you've got a, a, a safety issue, right, a security and safety issue, which we heard from tonight, you know, she called the police and nothing happened, um, all the way down to, you know, your office, um, the, um, you know, the, the environmental health, uh, department, um, you know, various groups that have the ability, code, code enforcement, you know, that have the ability to um, to enforce these things. It's just a question of whether or not they're doing it. And and you know, if there's a clearinghouse, it sounds like 
you know, that would be a place where these things can be referred. And I think in a lot of ways, the TLC is sort of functions as a clearinghouse when, when residents come to us. Um, I, I happen to chair our outreach subcommittee, so your outreach slide was particularly interesting to me. Um, uh, because one of the things that we're talking about in the outreach subcommittee, and I think as a commission we're going to try to do, is suggest to the county board that they require, uh, to the extent they're able to, um, a, a sheet, an information sheet that says, if you have these problems, here are the resources. And it be, you know, to the extent that we're, I'm a landlord, I'm already required to provide a uh, recycling sheet to every tenant when they move in, and then every, and then annually. Why can't you have something like that to do the kind of thing that you're talking about, where you know a, a, a tenant has um, you know, a place to go um, you know, so they can resolve their issues. However, the first being, and this is where I would differ you with, with you a little bit, Eric, is, is the lease, right? Because the lease is the contract that governs that tenant-landlord relationship, and the landlord has obligations to fulfill just like the tenant does. And sometimes there's abuse on the tenant side, and sometimes there's abuse on the landlord side. And the lease is what governs and determines whether or not there's abuse. So if the county has a resource to help somebody you know, interpret the lease and tell them, hey, you've got an issue here, or no, you don't. You know, I, I, I can tell you more stories offline, but, you know, sometimes they're, a resident's not happy with something, but that doesn't make it unsafe or illegal or abusive or anything like that. And so helping tenants navigate through those issues, I think, would be where the county could step in and provide kind of a, a service or some, you know, advisory services. I, they're probably, I've probably thrown out like three or four different ideas all at the same time because I want to stop talking, but... Um, Anyway, just things to consider, and, and I hope that you'll, maybe we should work with you all, the TLC should work with you all when it comes to some of the outreach efforts you're, you're talking about, because that's something that's been on our agenda this, this year. Yeah, no, is it okay if I respond to a few of those Please. ideas? Great. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much for, um, for sharing all of those thoughts, and I'll, I'll try to address at least a few of them. Um, so in terms of the suggestion of having a list of, you know, these are the key numbers to call in the county um, if a resident has a concern. Um, that is part of the packet that we're putting together um, that we're hoping to provide to residents electronically and also um, in paper um, this summer. And so we can certainly work with um, your outreach subcommittee as well if you'd like to preview that before we go to print. Um, so just to make sure that you know, from, from your lens and the issues that you hear month to month, are we hitting the key numbers? Are we getting the, the right information on that sheet? So if there's a certain agency that you're like, you know, we're constantly hearing, um, you know, that folks want to know how to access rental subsidies or something, and that's something that we have inadvertently left off that list, you can give us that feedback before we distribute. So I can pass that, um, that suggestion along to Jennifer Daniels. She's the one coordinating that. Um, and then also in terms of the county's ability to facilitate uh, disputes between residents and, and landlords and interpret leases, um, it's a service, it's a um, mediation service that the county previously provided years and years ago, um, probably about a decade or so ago, um, for a variety of reasons. I am not an attorney, so I will not try to speak to this, but our um, county attorneys have advised that we're not able to um, get involved in private disputes. And so one of the strategies that I mentioned tonight that I think you all or some of you are working on through the Tenant Landlord Commission with support from staff is looking at ways for alternative um, dispute resolution strategies. Um, so basically mechanisms um, that can be used when residents, for instance, come speak to all of you and say, I have a question about my lease, or I don't think that the owner is working, the landlord is working in good faith to um, uphold their part at their end of the lease. Um, basically, something like ADR that could be used so that the residents have a place to go um, so that they can have someone facilitate that discussion and ensure that their rights and responsibilities are upheld in that. Um, um, so thank you for raising that. Unfortunately, the county has a very limited role um, or next to no role in that. Um, but it is something that, again, is one of the strategies. Uh, yes, uh, let's go Julio. And then I think I saw where you had your hand up. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Karen here. Karen. All right, in that order. Uh, yes, I am. And you said thank you for being here. I have a question about the vendors that are involved. I just want to make sure that I would like to make sure that there's standards of quality 
uh, measures or however they're going to operate. I just remember one instance where, you know, ESI came into my unit and they checked my unit three times for mold and, and other items. Actually, they didn't even announce what they were testing. But I remember that each person tested it differently. One guy had the unit blowing, one guy had the balcony open, you know, it was just different. You know, you have to have the same standard for each one so, to, so you can see what you're going to get um, as a result. So I'm wondering about the, the inspections and anything that's going on uh, to make sure that it's done in a uniform process. Sure, yeah, I, I'm happy to speak to that. So for the um, compliance inspections, which again, um, don't necessarily include the mold testing. Um, so I wanna make that clear to everybody, but um, you know, we do have a vendor that we're using um, that we that is conducting probably about 80 or 90% of our inspections for us, which has helped us increase our capacity very quickly. Um, we do have our one of our compliance staff who is accompanying the, these inspectors, um, you know, especially at the beginning, just to ensure that quality control and to ensure that this inspections team, that there is consistency across how they are evaluating any conditions that they might observe in a unit. And so that is something that we do take very seriously to ensure that um, an inspection of unit A is conducted consistently with how the inspection is conducted in unit B. Um, that is something that we do care a lot about. And so, um, Marie, I'm going to put you on the spot. I don't know if you want to add anything to that in terms of how we ensure that there is consistency across those inspections with the vendor that we now have on board. Yeah, so I, I agree with everything Ann said. And then just for the other, for the environmental testing, the county puts out, you know, RFPs and RFQs for, you know, specific expertise for many, many, many things. And that is they have to meet certain qualifications, have certain licenses um, and, and you know, a, a host of other things that they have to respond to. So that is how we have our um, environmental testing company on board. Um, and that's, you know, if other departments, how they have other types of consultants and, you know, expertise um, that they are able to tap into as well. So there's there's two things there. There's our inspector or our inspections firm versus um, you know just the host of other resources that we have available that we'd still have to go under contract with, but they've already gone through the process so that we can access them pretty quickly. Okay, Thanks, thank Marie. So Laura, next. Yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you, Anne, for your report. Uh, some of my questions have already been answered by some of the other commissioners from the, both of our commissions here. One that I haven't heard an answer to yet is under the communication outreach section. In the second bullet point, um, it's mentioned that bilingual, bilingual user-friendly outreach materials will be provided. Is that English Spanish only, or will it be depending on the audience, like English Mongolian or English Vietnamese? In other words, will it be multiple bilingual language materials? So um, thank you. Yes, I'm happy to clarify that. So again, this is referring to um, that communications packet that um, the that we've talked about a couple times now tonight that will include a bunch of resources on how residents can get more information and be connected to the services that the county provides. So my understanding, and again, Rolda, please chime in if I'm misstating this, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this effort, but is that the initial packet will be translated into English and Spanish, but there will be a QR code or some um, some sort of resource that will allow residents to access a number of other languages. Um, so if they need Amharic, um, Arabic, any other um, of, I think, one of 12 languages or, or whatever is offered, they will be able to use that QR code so that they can receive those translations um, of those materials. Rolda, did I get that close? Do you, yes. do you know? Uh, Oh, maybe one in here. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is the same that uh, it'll be offered in English and then the most prominent language uh, in the county, which would be Spanish, but that there will be some QR code that would allow people to go in online and select a different language. Yeah. What is a person? Thank you, Saul. <laughs> uh, that sounds good and it sounds, I, I get it, resources are limited and everything, but what if there's a straight person out there that just doesn't have a cell phone or something? What do they do if they don't have that kind of device? Well, can they get um, a written copy? I, I don't want to speak for the county, but um, and um, 
I believe we had a discussion about there being someone downstairs here in the Bosman Center that would provide resources and a phone line that would be like a, a, a hotline. So I don't know if that would help address that. So the county does have access to our language line that does provide um, interpretation in a number of different languages. I don't remember how many exactly. Um, in terms of the, situ the specific situation that you mentioned where someone receives this written packet and they don't have access to um, any device, they don't have access to a computer, they don't own a phone, they don't have any way to access this QR code. Um, I would need to get back to you on what they would do in that situation. Um, we do, of course, have access to electronic means at our libraries and community centers and other areas around the, the county to help bridge that digital gap for, for residents who do find themselves in that situation. Um, and especially some of our senior residents who maybe don't have computers or phones or things like that. Um, but in terms of, you know, what happens in that moment when they get the packet and they don't speak English and they don't speak Spanish um, and they need assistance with that, um, I would need to get back to you on what happens in that situation. That'd be great to know. I just have one more follow-up question. And this is in the capital investment section where um, in the first bullet point you talk about AHIP agreements um, um, being strengthened requirements for inspections and compliance, reporting progress after issues are identified. Um, I think this gets to what Eric and others around the table have been talking about, about the, there's a lot of progress being made with processes, but the proofs of the pudding with the actions. And we even heard from our speakers tonight about, um, you know, for example, our second set of speakers in particular, where they've made their complaints and their concerns known and they're just not getting any reaction. Do these, you know, compliance and requirements, do we lay out like, it is expected that within a certain number of hours or days, you know, like this will be resolved or at least you'll re report back. And if there's, you know, non-compliance with that, that there's some, you know, penalty for the landlord. I mean, it seems out, I, I'm not trying to be offensive to the landlord's room, but it just seems kind of outrageous that somebody who has a disability, um, you know, like, or anybody really, that's reporting what seems to be some extreme trash issues um, or this, what sounds like a very real liability is waiting to happen with this um, unsecure laundry room, they should have responded, um, and they haven't. Um, how, how will you strength, you know, attack that kind of situation with the strength of those language, or does it? So, um, so first, let me start by saying, um, you know, again, we will be following up with the owner um, to confirm that 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 connection has been made, um, and as I think you know, some owners in the room can attest to sometimes property management companies hear of concerns and the land and the owner n never hears about it or knows that the property management company is not doing what they need to do to follow up um, appropriately. So that's where we can be helpful to, to say, hey, we were at this meeting, we heard about this. Did you even know this was going on? And how is your property management company responding? Um, so again, it shouldn't come to that. But if, in fact, you know, these things have been reported and the property management company is not following up, um, you know, we certainly can can help bridge that a little bit. Now, in terms of what was added to AHIF agreements. So, again, this would be specific to um, um, agreements that are signed from this point forward. So this is, um, you know, this is not necessarily retroactive to agreements that are already in place, um, but we are you know, ensuring that the county has the right to perform on-site inspections of these properties at least one time per year. I will say most of the agreements that I'm familiar with, we already have that right. So I just want to make clear, I don't think that that's necessarily a new thing. Um, but one thing that we did add is that if we're contacted by a resident or a tenant representative about, um, a re you know, a maintenance concern, that we can basically um, perform an immediate inspection um, of the property or specific residential unit, um, potentially even waiving some of the notice um, provisions that we typically would have. And the main thing with that is that if we're going to view a residential unit, we do typically have to provide 24 hours notice, it's Virginia law. But if the resident is reaching out to us and saying, come now, come look at this, and we have the ability to do so, um, that we don't necessarily have to notify the owner, we, we can go on site and, and do that. Um, 
further if through these annual inspections, the ones that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So again, we're, we're doing thousands of inspections this fiscal year. If through that process, if more than 75% of all inspected units fail that their inspection, we can do some additional things. And this is new. So this is newly added language going forward. Um, so first, we have the option to find the borrower in default if the deficiencies are not addressed to <clears throat> our reasonable satisfaction within 90 days. Now, I think everyone in the room would agree, finding the borrower in default is really an option of last resort. We don't like to do that because it can send a whole ripple effect. It can send their first trust into default. It can, it can result in some very unstable conditions for the residents in that building. So that really is an option of last resort, but we have the ability to do that. We also can require written reports from the owner addressing unit conditions and how they're going to follow up and take actions to, um, to address the deficiencies. We also can disallow the borrower from taking any residual receipt or priority distribution payment unless those payments are being used to correct the deficiencies that we've identified. So basically, in a lot of our loan agreements, we have we split the available cash flow at the end of the year. Um, we split that with the owner in some percentage form. And basically what this is saying is if we are finding a number of units in disrepair and they're not being corrected within this time frame, we can disallow the borrower from taking their share of those residual receipts. So that's another tool that we are including. And then lastly, um, we can also disallow the borrower from increasing rents until those deficiencies are corrected um, to our satisfaction. So again, for those math whizzes in the room, that's not a great option because it really can impact their ability to operate the property. Um, you know, collecting rents and making increases to keep up with inflation um, is often necessary um, for the owners to, to, again, be able to maintain their property. Um, but at the same time, we don't want those owners who are not properly maintaining their properties um, to be increasing rents on residents until we're satisfied the deficiencies are resolved. So again, these are in what I would call egregious situations, but it gives us more tools to follow up. Um, and then the last thing is that we also are, you know, we have added language in our agreements going forward that uh, we can require the owners to do and pay for our capital needs assessment um, at the request of county staff. So um, many owners are already doing these anyway, but it basically allows us, again, if we have concerns about the overall state of the property, um, that we can request that the owner do a capital needs assessment and share those results with the county so that, again, we can ensure that uh, longer term fixes are being addressed and um, estimated budgets are in place to um, address identified repairs. So that was a very long answer to your question, but I just wanted to provide a little more detail around some of this added language that we have, are including in agreements going forward. No, that helped, Anne. Thank you so much. That sounds like good promising work and the detail is helpful. Eric, you were on deck. Well, you I still have your question. I, yeah, you know what? I, I'll draw the question, but um, Saul actually pointed something out to me. Do you want to, so, Ann, you talked about the customer CRM, which some of us might know what that sort of is, but the customer relation module, which is essentially a lot of companies use Salesforce and these, you know, types of software to kind of track complaints, track matters, whatever. So it sounds like you're going to do that for, or is I guess it's complaints. Uh, you know, folks coming to the county, what's that going to be used for? So the way the system is set up now, we're at stage one. So stage okay. one um, basically means um, we're using this to handle grams. Please don't ask me what that acronym means, but basically when a resident files like an official uh, other county staff help me out, but um, where I think a county board member then asks staff to follow up on a particular issue. So it's almost like an official, um, it's not quite a FOIA, but it is an inquiry. Can staff find out more information about XYZ? And then the board member basically reports back. Um, so where we are with this CRM, this customer relationship management or customer response management system, is that basically it's replacing our GRAM system right now. So as those requests are, are pulled in, it's a way for the county manager's office and the county board office to centralize those requests 
and track um, how quickly they were resolved and responded to by staff and that kind of thing. The eventual goal, so again, like stage five of this, would be that all the individual systems that different departments and divisions are using right now um, to track resident inquiries that come in. So for instance, if someone calls our housing division, we have a tracker tool so we can sort of keep track of, you know, so-and-so from this property called, had this complaint, this staff person followed up, talked to these people, and then the date that it was resolved or not, and the, that sort of thing. So like we have our own internal system that we use. DHS and all their divisions, they have all of their different systems. Code enforcement has their own system. So everyone has their own different systems. So eventually what the CRM is envisioned to do is to create a centralized system for the county so that those inquiries, rather than being tracked in all these different divisions and departments, could be tracked centrally. And that will allow us, um, it'll better equip us to identify trends um, so, um, so that again, we can be more responsive if we're seeing that, you know, a number of inquiries are coming in for a certain property or a certain owner, it'll, it'll better position us to be proactive in that situation. So, yeah, and, I, and I'm asking because Saul was pointing out the one that, that I think DES has, uh, yeah, in the My Arlington app for, uh, you know, it's different, it's a totally different situation, but potholes, right, and things like yeah. that. It certainly, I think it has value pipe internally for you all, but also building trust. It's always good for government to build trust with um, residents that things are being done quickly and providing information in real time. So maybe that's something to aspire to here. Uh, DES seems to have something going. So. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's the dream. <laughs> I mean, staff would really love, you know, for all residents to have an app on their phone, should they have a phone, um, you know, through a computer, through a call center, uh, the new information desk that you all saw downstairs, whatever point of entry they use, um, that they would have an opportunity for this concern um, to be put in a central place so that we can, again, really identify those trends and be really better at at being proactive and, and saying, hey, we're seeing a lot coming in, you know, um, for this property or this section of the county is seeing increased rodent um, activity. What's going on down there? And like really to be able to do mapping and like all this really cool stuff so that we can be better positioned to respond to, um, you know, to our residents. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, I think I saw Callan first and then Sarah and then Oh. Was like oh, I'm sorry. I thought, so yeah. I, I have a quick question. I think mm -hmm. it's quick. Um, so my concern is that people, obviously, this evening, they don't know if they live in a cap unit or they, they live in a market rate unit. How will people be able to determine that they have these resources available for them? Like, do you, you put your address in and then it pops up? If you live here, you get this service. If you live here, you don't get anything? Or I don't know. How does that work? So the, the resource packet that we're going to be distributing, we will be targeting um, residents who are living in our CAF properties. So by virtue of if they receive that packet, those are the resources available to those residents. Now I will say most of the resources in the packet that we're including, they're available to all residents in the county, um, as long as they meet the eligibility criteria for those various programs. So we do have residents who live in the county, not necessarily in a CAF unit, but they're income eligible for a variety of services at the county. Um, so, you know, so basically while our outreach with those materials is going to be targeted um, to the residents living in those CAF units, I would say that even if a resident lives in a market unit, um, it's really based on their income in a lot of cases, whether or not they would be eligible for the resources that we'll be sharing. Um, and then some of the other resources that, you know, we were talking about tonight, if someone wants to call code enforcement or public health, you know, really anyone, any one of us, you know, who lives in Arlington would have access to that regardless of income. So, um, so it really is just trying to be better about getting that information out, um, again, with uh, a focus on our residents in our CAF properties in case maybe they don't have access to computers. Um, and other means for getting the information. I think that that's where having that light person downstairs and having that hotline would also be helpful because that person would be then be connected, say, if they have a complaint about an apartment, right? 
they can be connected with their housing information services and they can identify. You know, once they speak with a the person, they can look up and be like, okay, so you live in affordable housing in a market rate market. That's where I find it. The usual, the usual in, the, in, the, in the hotline, yeah, and having some downstairs to be able to answer questions. Uh, and I had a question about resident councils, uh, funny enough, um, and also eviction prevention plan. So great to see that it says that the county's added provisions to AHIP agreements requiring that they have plans and also support resident councils. And it says in parentheses, funding and space. Can you provide more details about, like, you know, what type of funding, like how much, what is that for? Is it ongoing? When, you know, just start up? Um, what does space mean in this context? And also a little bit more about the eviction prevention plans, like what um, what's required as part of that? Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to the physical compliance language that um, we talked about a few minutes ago that we're, you know, we're adding to our AF agreements going forward, we also have those two sections, um, Kellen, that you just referenced to really help strengthen um, resident protections and enable and empower more resident voice at the properties. And so with the eviction prevention process, um, without oversimplifying too much, it basically requires that the owners will have an agreed upon process with DHS. So DHS, this is really their space. And so really saying, you know, you will work with the DHS staff and you and the human services director um, will, you know, will need to sign off on what that process is. Um, and so there needs to be an eviction prevention strategy in place um, that, again, is mutually agreed upon and any future changes to that policy um, or strategy would need to be agreed upon as well. So um, shorthand, that's what that protection is that's being added. For the tenant council and association, the language that we have um, right now is that if a resident council were to form at the property, um, that the owner would allow for use of a community center if, if one is available. Some of our properties don't have um, common space or community centers. Um, so again, this won't be universal. We'll have to tailor it depending on what the project is. Um, but basically use of the community center um, during normal operating hours or as mutually agreed to um, between the, you know, the county and the um, owner. So we can help advocate for that resident group if you know, they really need to meet Tuesday nights at eight o'clock. Um, you know, how can we make that happen? So it, it enables the county to step in and and help negotiate that a little bit. In terms of the budget, um, the way that we've set this up right now is that it would be an annual budget uh, for that resident group that would form. And it really would be sized based on the size of the property. Barcroft is going to be different from, I'm going to pick a smaller property, uh, Fisher House. You know, so it, it really needs to be sized, I think, based on, um, you know, how big the property is. The the one that we put forward um, for Park Sherlington, just by way of, of example, is that it would be $500 per year or not less than $500 per year. Okay. So um, those are examples. Thank you. Um, also, it, going back to where you're talking about site plans and the county staff that looked into and I assume this is also like the county attorney, whether or not you could attach like quality of life provisions to site plans. And it's it seems like the county came away and said, no, legally they can't require that. Um, and just if you can provide any more detail about, um, you know, is that something potentially as we look at legislative requirement or legislative priorities um, that we should be looking at asking the General Assembly to allow the county to have the ability for site plan uh, projects to, to attach conditions related to um, like quality of life issues. So the challenge that we ran into um, with site plan conditions is that they really need to have um, what in the legal world, world they call an essential nexus to the project. So for example, Example, addressing impacts of the project itself. So if the project's being built and as a result is going to cause increased strain on surrounding infrastructure, then the county can basically say because of that impact, you need to um, improve the, the infrastructure surrounding the building. Um, so what we were told um, and what we learned through our attorneys 
is that in this case, mandating habit habitability standards via site plan conditions really are beyond the scope of the county's authority in approving these site plans. Um, it, ju it just goes beyond what we're allowed to do. Um, so again, I am not an attorney. Um, I can't really speak to it beyond that. Um, I don't know if David wants to take a crack at interpreting or taking on further what I what I'm, I struggling, I'm struggling to think of something that's more essential to a, a site plan than the people who are going to live in it. But, um, I, you know, I, I am curious what analysis, you know, was, was generated as a result of that inquiry. And I wonder if we can get our hands on it. I, I can I can certainly ask about that. Um, yeah. But anyway, so so anyway, but that is that is what we were told. And so that that was the barrier to putting anything in our site plan conditions related to ongoing habitability. Is, you know, and again, just to circle back to you know, my point about the legislative priorities, like that seems like a perfect type of thing that if the county is like, oh, we'd really like to be able to do this. Um, and the county attorney is like, well, we don't have the legal authority um, that that should be something that we start advocating to the board to like, hey, let's go to Richmond and, and request that we be able to attach some conditions for site plans when it comes to, you know, making sure that the premise is habitable beyond just code enforcement um, and, you know, looking at things like mold and, and other issues like that. Okay, uh, Sarah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. This has been super helpful. Um, the increase in inspections looks awesome. I'm just curious how you, how the county decides which properties or units to inspect um, of all of them, that percentage. Yeah, absolutely. So we take a number of things into consideration when we generate our list um, of inspections uh, for any any given time period. We look at how long it's been since the last time we did a full inspection of a property. Um, we look at the age of the property. We look at um, if we are seeing an uptick in concerns um, around a certain property. Uh, we might say, well, let's put that on our list so that we can get eyes on it ourselves. Um, Marie, help me out. I'm trying to think some of the other criteria that we that we use. Did I miss anything? Um, no, it, and we have um, with this uh, increased inspection process, we have, you know, there's been properties that if not, not the full property, we've done like half or something like that. If, if we're just like, hey, we just want to make sure things are, are going well. So we will, you know, throw it on the throw it on the end. So we've we've done a couple of those and, and um, you know, having the funds and having a third party has just been invaluable and in being able to do, you know, numbers, do it, you know, more than once. We'll go out more than once a year. Um, so we're really trying to, um, you know, make sure we have eyes on on things that we're hearing about. Related to that uh, question, do we have any idea about an estimate for 2024? Is the, is the, are the numbers going to continue going up or is the funding going to go away? Like, yeah. Do you want me to take a crack at that, Marie, or do you want to answer that? So we do have um, uh, we do have in the in the FY24 budget um, 150,000 for uh, again for FY24. Um, we are we have a new um, inspections firm, so they are local. So you know we're um, looking at how you know they don't have to charge us per diem and travel and that sort of thing. So um, you know we're sort of watching the shakeout between like what their you know inspections per unit or or you know their our hourly charge versus you know the other firm and how that goes. We are also hoping to split some in the fall, some in the spring. And again, um, our compliance officers also do some inspections when they go and do um, their compliance reviews. So we are looking like our goal is to do about 2000 every year. If we can do more, we will, you know, we will do it. We, you know, we have that's one of the, you know, fantastic um, things that can happen when, when we do have, you know, this, this extra staff to step in when we need them to. So our goal is 2000 a year and, you know, and possibly more, you know, around there. So 2,000, 2,200. Great. Glad to hear it's not going to drop off a cliff. And it's my, as well. I have just a question on, um, you know, is there any plans to bring the owners along and maybe some of the trends that you're seeing uh, with the code enforcers? You know, I think, there might be an opportunity with some of the oldest properties in Arlington, some of the things that they're experiencing, 
to put it on the radar for some of the properties that might be 10 years you know, behind them. Is there any thought on that? Or? Mike, I think that's you speaking. Sorry, I can't see you. Um, are, are you asking, I, I'm sorry, could you say a little more about code enforcement trends to make sure, sure. I'm answering your yeah, question? So, so when we find out about issues, it's already at the most egregious state, right? Uh, it, it's millions of dollars to, to repair it or update it or replace it, tear it down, what have you. I wonder if there's an opportunity to take some of those case studies or trends that we're seeing in code enforcement and to form a broader cap community to say, hey, here's some of the things that we're seeing in our, you know, most egregious or oldest properties. You might want to put this on your radar so that doesn't catch up to you. Does that help? I see. So, yeah, so a couple things. And again, let me know if I'm if I'm not answering your question. Um, so the inspections that we're doing that Marie just referenced, those are not code enforcement inspections. Those are housing quality standard inspections. So they're actually broader. They touch more things than code enforcement. Um, but code enforcement referrals can be made out of those inspections that we are doing. So if we're in a unit and we see something that could be code um, a code enforcement concern. The, con the struggle there is that the resident has to be the one to reach out to code enforcement in order to request that code enforcement inspection. We are not able to do that. We can facilitate. So we can suggest to the resident, hey, we think we should refer you to code enforcement. We can give you the phone number and so on, and we can help make that connection. But it has to be the resident that actually reaches out to code. So, um, so with all that in mind, um, we are working on how to make that referral process easier and um, as least burdensome as possible for the residents. Um, but that is that is the process that's that's happening. Now, I will say just trends that we see in general for housing quality standards. So, housing quality standards, depending on the number of bedrooms in a unit um, and a number of other factors, the checklist is quite long. Um, it can, you know, exceed 50 items, I think, Marie, 50 to 70 items or something like that. Um, and it includes everything from things that the that the owner is responsible for. The majority are things that the owner is responsible for. There are some things on the checklist, though, that reflect resident behavior as well. So, for instance, if we see concerns about housekeeping or if there are locks that are installed on interior doors that could be um, a fire or safety hazard, so um, some of the things that we can flag that can cause a unit to fail um, inspection, um, the majority of those items are the result of owner behaviors, but there also are some things on the checklist that can be the result of resident behaviors too. So we do share with our owners, and often they're well aware, honestly, you know, what, um, you know, what the trends are of, you know, things that we see that are common. Um, but again, typically not a lot of surprises, um, you know, when talking to the owners in terms of things that are very common that we see. And just like our own homes, you know, things can be perfect one day. And especially for any of us who have children, um, they run through a room like a tornado and knock a closet off the track and now it would fail inspection. So, um, you know, so there are a lot of things that can happen in a unit to cause it to fail. Did, did that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, I guess I, I'm just wondering, how do we share those be best practices with the larger community? Um, you know, we're seeing like a certain issues in that inspection. How do we kind of say, hey, we're starting to see this tick up. You might want to, you know, do some investments now so that it doesn't end up with a larger thing. But we can talk more offline about it. Yeah, no, I'm happy to answer that very quickly now. Um, one of the things that we do, um, we also have our financial monitoring that we do um, of, you know, properties that have loans with the county. So that is a really good opportunity through our financial monitoring to talk about trends that we're seeing on the physical side. So again, if we're seeing a lot of moisture issues at a particular property, often the owner, um, I'll just say the owner's not unaware, um, you know, it's not usually a surprise, 
but it's a good opportunity through financial monitoring to say, hey, from an asset management perspective, we're seeing a lot of moisture issues at this particular property, or hey, this particular property had a lot of initial fails. You know, can we talk about some maintenance issues that might be going on there? What kinds of investments are you making, um, both on the operating side, but even longer term? Again, we talked about capital needs assessments. You know, have you done one recently? Are you looking to do one soon? Can you please share those results with the county? Um, so really, it's a good opportunity to have that conversation. And those trends that we're sharing in those conversations would be trends that we're seeing within the portfolio of that owner, um, which typically is what they care about anyway. Um, but I would say the other piece of this is, again, what education can we do on the resident side as well? You know, I mentioned some of the things that residents may not even realize um, that they're doing in their own units that could be fire hazards. Um, you know, boy, that smoke alarm, it goes off sometimes when I'm cooking and it's really loud and wakes up my son who worked a night shift down the hall. I'm taking it down. I'm just dismantling it. Well, that's a we can't do that. So, you know, so what can we do on the county end to to provide education to residents um, to talk through the things they can do um, within their units to ensure their units remain safe um, and, you know, and help reduce the chance that rodents will want to be attracted to their unit and so on um, because of housekeeping issues and things like that. So, you know, what are things we can do on the resident side as well? OK, and I'm mindful of time, so uh, everyone will take a few more questions and then we'll start to wrap up. Uh, Colin, I know you had one. Um, and so my question, during the Serrano sort of crisis, we heard a lot about discrimination, complaints, fair housing, you know, potential allegations. Um, and that was also an issue for the county in that um, the Office of Human Rights didn't really get involved and uh, there wasn't really a clear referral system in place for fair housing complaints. I don't see anything in the report um, that you guys provided today about fair housing. Um, and I know there's work to help connect all the different offices and departments who are you know, part of sort of the nexus of housing issues. Can you talk about what, if any, role the Office of Human Rights has had in that? And also knowing that they're not necessary. I, I wouldn't recommend that a resident go to the Office of Human Rights for a fair housing complaint because they don't even have all the protected classes that the state does. Um, do you have a process in place to refer people to HUD, to refer them to the State Office of Fair Housing? Um, can you kind of talk through that? And my second question is just, at the very beginning, you had said if we had other suggestions or recommendations to let you know, we produced a report last year, I think with 33 recommendations, um, maybe half of them lined up with the county, I think the other half did not line up with this. It'd be really great, and I know that's not going to happen tonight, but to know like specifically, does the county plan to pursue any of the other recommendations that were in the joint commission report, um, but not part of the cash strategy? Yeah, so um, I can speak first to if we receive an inquiry that sounds like um, a possible discrimination complaint. Um, those referrals, and Hector, I see you're on, so please um, chime in if I misstate this, but we're making those referrals to the county's Office of Human Rights um, rather than through HUD. Hector, can you confirm that? When we receive calls in regards to discrimination, we refer them either to the Fair Housing Office in Virginia or the Office of Human Rights uh, and the county manager. They can choose either one of them. They will both investigate, but they will not do it at the same time. Uh, preferably, it's recommended that they take uh, Fair Housing in Virginia that way it's more ample and they have more ability to investigate. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. So so those are the options that we provide um, when our office receives, because again, Office of Human Rights is, is separate from, from us. Um, but we provide those referrals, as Hector said, either to um, the state office or to um, the county office of human rights. Um, regarding the the joint um, joint commission report. Um, as some of you know, we worked 
really closely um, with, with the commissioners who worked on that report. We worked very closely with you when developing our strategies. And then also um, we're appreciative that you gave us the opportunity um, to have a preview copy of some of the recommendations you were putting forward as well. And I will say we did look through every and consider every single recommendation that you had in your joint report. And again, because we had the opportunity of talking through a lot of those recommendations before we even published our strategies, like five months or so earlier, um, to consider whether to include them in ours. The ones that were not added to our strategies typically fell into two different buckets, um, one of two different buckets. One, either if the county was not resourced um, in order to carry out the strategy, um, and we did not have indications that we would be resourced um, anytime during implementation. So that is one situation that we found ourselves in. Or if, again, through consultation through our county attorneys or other agencies within the county, there were certain recommendations um, that, that it was determined we did not have the authority to carry out. So those were the two, um, I, I'm generalizing, but if, if something did not directly tie between the two documents, um, it was either due to resources or a concern that the county may not have the authority to carry out the recommendation. But we did consider all of them and appreciated the opportunity to work with the joint committee on, on that report. I, I think, Anne, it would be helpful, and maybe this is you know a longer term thing, just if there are things that the county from that report that are not included in the CAP strategies that, that the county would like to do is like, hey, we would love to be able to do this in the future. We don't have the resources today. It would just be helpful to know what are some of those, like what are some of the key things that if you were going to try to incorporate that into future work plans, what would those be? Because um, there's quite a few of them that aren't um, that aren't included in the CAP strategies documents. So I think from a commission advocacy perspective, it'd be helpful to know which ones the county's strongly considering for the future versus that we don't think that's something that we'll probably ever do. I'm mean, on that topic. Is there an internal determination for each of those uh, things that the county decided not to pursue? Do you know, like a paragraph on why they didn't and what they did to investigate it? So I could um, go back and see what information we have for each of those and the review that we did. Um, and see how to best follow up if that works. Yeah, that would be great. I, th I think, yeah, to both commissions would be great. Eric, and we're going to really. Yeah, uh, sorry, I wasn't actually, but something that you said kind of um, concerns me. I hope that the county's not discouraging people from filing discrimination complaints <laughs> locally. Um, I'm a little worried about them maybe encouraging folks to go to the state level. Uh, my experience, uh, complaints of this nature are always best resolved at the low, uh, lowest local level. Um, and if the county's not ad adequately resourced, um, then that's also a concern. So I don't know if that's the case, but um, it sounds like maybe folks are being encouraged to file the state. They're, they're not adequately resourced. Okay. And then, they don't have the same protections as the state, too. So, yeah, there's a lot of problems there. All right. Okay, uh, well, I just have one last thing for you, Anne. Um, if there were one thing that you could uh, you know, use, if, if you could say one thing to the county board through the TLC or the Housing Commission, what what would you what would you put down? What would you have us tell them? This is the moment that Anne Venezia gets fired from the housing director position. Um, gosh. Uh, the hardest question of the night. Thank you for saving it to the end. Um, I will. How about this? I, I'm going to um, I'm going to punt a little bit on this one um, for preservation of my job. But I will say we are really, really grateful, and I mean this with all sincerity. We are so grateful that the county board elected to put $150,000 in ongoing funds, um, which had not been in the manager's proposed budget. Um, 
you know, in the final adopted budget for 2024. Um, by putting in an ongoing, um, it will enable us to, to use that money um, in future fiscal years as well. So we're really grateful for that. Yeah, great. Well, Anne, um, you uh, are fantastic at your job and we're very appreciative yeah. of the hard work that you're doing and uh, grateful that you took the time to talk to us tonight. Um, unless there's anything else, uh, we release you and, <laughs> and, and, and look forward to seeing you in a few months, hopefully once we've had, once you've had time to uh, you know, get some data from the CAF research that you're doing. We're really excited about that. So thank you so much. Absolutely. And if commissioners have additional questions after tonight, I know um, many of you only just received a copy of the report today um, and maybe you haven't even opened it yet. Um, our staff is available. Um, feel free. I don't know what the appropriate protocols are, but, you know, working through Alex and Rolda, if you want to share additional questions that we can answer after tonight um, and you've had time to actually process the information and, and read that appendix, there's a lot of good information in there, too. So, um, you know, we're happy to answer questions after tonight as well. Great. Well, then uh, can I hear a, a motion to adjourn? So moved. I think it needs to be. So <laughs> 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 <laughs>